sorry, I'm, I'm an academic, uh, and the organizers have asked me to put recent developments in Turkey in a wider historical context, so that's what I will aim to do. Uh, my general tendency is, is to speak in uh, terms of centuries, but I will spare you and focus on uh, the last two uh, decades, and mostly on Turkey's relationship uh, with the West. Um, what I want to do in the brief time I have is try to answer the question of uh, how much of the dem domestic developments in Turkey in the last 18 years of AKP governance were actually driven by international dynamics. Uh, the way this question is usually answered really varies with where you are when you're asking it. If you ask the question in Turkey, uh, the answer you'll get is simple. Uh, for President Erdogan and his supporters, everything that they associate uh, with uh, positive developments in the last 18 years uh, is an accomplishment of Erdogan and Turkey. Uh, the, the massive <coughs> infrastructure projects, uh, such as the, uh, the tunnel under the Bosphorus or the third bridge over it, the new roads, shopping malls, uh, the um, major uh, seeming economic growth the country has experienced in the le last decade or so. These are all products of uh, Erdogan's uh, grand vision carefully executed. Anything that uh, is considered a negative, by contrast, is, uh, is an insidious ploy by foreign powers and traitors who work for foreign powers. Uh, the Gezi protests in 2013, uh, the Gülenist betrayal of uh, Erdogan and AKP, the coup attempt in 2016, the current economic wobble the country is experiencing, which is not uh, called officially a crisis. Uh, these are the works of uh, foreigners who are envious of Turkey's rise and who desire to put a stop to it. So this is the official narrative inside Turkey. And if you ask the question outside of Turkey, uh, then they relatively unexamined assumption is that Turkey's derailment of the path of democracy is perhaps tragic, uh, but it's own doing. Uh, it has nothing to do with global dynamics. What has happened only goes to show that Turkey is one of these places, like Russia, that is not really cut out for democracy to begin with. So what I want to do is to complicate both of these narratives uh, simultaneously, both the nationalist Turkish one that blames the West for all of Turkey's stumbles and the Western one that dismisses Turkey's failings as self-contained and domestic. What I'm going to argue instead is that Erdogan and the AKP have ridden what was until now a very fortuitous wave of international factors. And Turkey's upward and downward political trajectory in the 21st century cannot be understood except by paying careful uh, uh, attention to these global dynamics. Far from being hurt by foreign meddling, Erdogan's uh, regime has been very much helped by, along by international factors, especially until 2013. I don't mean this in a conspiratorial sense. Uh, I mean something rather akin to a willful blindness. Uh, you might be familiar with the term irrational exuberance, uh, used to refer to market behavior. Uh, in order to explain uh, overvaluation behind economic bubbles such as the dot-com bubble of the 1990s or the housing uh, bubble of the mid aughts in, uh, in the United States. What I'm suggesting is that Erdogan, his party, the AKP, and by extension Turkey as a country was at the receiving end of such a moment of irrational exuberance in the global system. In other words, an overvaluation by international political and economic actors uh, in especially the first decade of the 21st century. Without this ir irrational exuberance, Erdogan could not have consolidated the current power he has. The inter this international irrational exuberance about Turkey's prospects had several components. Uh, the economic component is the most obvious in some ways, but the damage it has wrought is only now becoming uh, apparent in Turkey. Uh, like all economic stories, it's a complicated one. Uh, but for time-saving purposes, let us summarize it by saying that much of Turkey's much-wanted economic success under the AKP was accomplished on the back of cheap global credit, looking for a high-yield high place to go after the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. Uh, Adam Tuz also notes in his recent book, Crashed, uh, that by 2015, governments and 
businesses outside of America had piled up uh, 9.8 trillion of debt uh, denominated in US dollars. And 3.3 trillion of this debt was owed by emerging markets. Between 2008 and 2013, especially Turkey was among uh, chief, uh, chief among a group of so-called rising power countries that benefited from this availability. Uh, thanks partly to the magic of public relations and marketing, in this period Turkey had branded itself successfully as a second tier but certainly up and coming brick-like country. Uh, in this low interest international environment, the Turkish banks, state and private, uh, liberally borrowed money and there seemed to be no limits to how much you could borrow. In the meantime, the AKP government announced bid after bid of uh, giant public-private hybrid on infrastructure projects the private parts of which were almost always awarded to businessmen with AKP ties, and whose bids were also underwritten by state bank loans resting on the same cheap international credit. These infrastructures serve dual purposes. On the one hand, they allowed Erdogan to create his own oligarchs, to so, so to speak, whose economic fortunes were entirely tied to their support of the AKP. Uh, and uh, these new cadre of businessmen eliminated or provided a counter balance to the old money uh, in Turkey. Uh, at the same time, the infrastructures, while ongoing, generated their own secondary economy, uh, kept many people employed in the construction sector. Uh, the housing projects helped increase home ownership, uh, and transportation projects in major cities uh, helped improve, improve the commute of recent migrants from rural areas who often live in peripheral areas of the city and who uh, make up much of uh, Erdogan's base. Shopping malls uh, helped fill the leisure hours of this new lower middle class. All in all, these developments generally created the impression of an erstwhile developing country just on the verge of takeoff. Uh, in the meantime, actual manufacturing holdings of the states were privatized or, and or stripped for real estate uh, value and domestic agriculture was increasingly overtaken by imports. In other words, not all, but much of the economic growth of Turkey in this period was an illusion built on cheap credit, unsustainable in the long run. These days, Turkish economy is coming face to face with the reality that it was built on a house of cards. Uh, the second component of the international irrational exuberance about Turkey was political. After 2008, around the same time Turkey started benefiting from an inflow of cheap credit that bolstered its economy, the Obama administration was looking for a way to disentangle US foreign policy from the Middle East while correcting for some of what they saw as the missteps of the Bush years. In the next years uh, after, uh, the image of Turkey's booming economy and the, uh, and the Obama administration's desire to find a middleman to delegate its administration's in interest in the region converged on the narrative of a so-called Turkish model. It's difficult to remember now, given all that has transpired in the intervening years, but especially after the inception of Arab Spring in late 2010, the idea that Turkey was a model for the region was very heavily pushed, not just by Turkey, but also by the US. I can personally attest to this because I attended a lot of policy meetings with uh, American policymakers on the Arab Spring in that period, uh, and the unpleasant task of pointing out that Turks did not really know or understand their supposed neighborhood any better than Americans would always fall to me. Uh, I spent the 2012-13 academic year in a Washington DC uh, policy fellowship, and now it almost amuses me to remember how positive the image of Turkey was uh, uh, back then. A rising power, an economic miracle, a country that had finally reconciled dem democracy, Islam, capitalism, etc. Not much attention was paid to critics who suggested uh, that Turkey still had not sorted out its own domestic problems, especially in, in the area of human rights and its treatment of its own Kurdish population, and therefore were skeptical that it could sort out the rest of the Middle East. This rosy picture of Turkey was being pushed uh, by think tanks with connections to the Turkish government, who had an obvious interest in maintain, maintaining such an image. But it resonated with American policymakers because it was a story they wanted to hear and liked hearing. At least what, uh, part of what has transpired in Syria uh, can be traced back to the errors of judgment committed in that particular time period. <laughs> 
To sum up, between 2008 and 2013, Turkey's economic situation and global political stature was artificially inflated by a confluence of factors directly resulting from the political and economic crises the US and Europe had found themselves in due to the mistakes of the early odds. This was a period everyone in the West was focused on problems here and wanted to believe in the feel-good narrative of rising non-Western powers who would help alleviate the problems of international markets and share the burdens of global governance and management of problem regions like the Middle East. At a critical juncture for them domestically, the AKP and Erdogan very much benefited from this desire in the West to have a feel-good story about Turkey. Meanwhile, the idea that Turkey was returning to its historical roots as a major regional power was very marketable domestically because for historical reasons, international stature matters very much to the uh, domestic population. Excessive Western support for Erdogan in the period prior to 2013 also made it very difficult for domestic critics to launch serious opposition to him because those critics themselves were accustomed to using the West as a reference. After the 2000 Gezi protests, the 2013 Gezi protests, the narrative of a Turkish model for the Middle East quickly expired as it became apparent by each year that Turkey was not the country the Obama administration had imagined it to be. Ironically, the Gezi protests also happened to coincide with the same moment that uh, the US Fed decided to put the brakes on cheap credit. Turkish currency took a double hit, though not as badly as the one experienced this past summer. And Erdogan quickly switched to a new script of blaming the interest lobby and an envious <coughs> West for Turkey's troubles, a refrain that he has kept up since. This is another narrative that has a lot of adherence in Turkey because it is a familiar one. Uh, all school children are taught about how the Ottoman Empire was secretly undermined by colonial European powers intent on carving up its territories especially coming after a period of seeming economic prosperity and meteor meteoric international rise, the surreptitious sabotage narrative made sense to people on the street. It jived with their learned anxieties about the international order. Thus, in the summer of 2013, the bu bubble of Western irrational exuberance about Turkey was punctured, if not entirely <coughs> deflated. Since then, this bubble has been letting off steam at an ever-growing pace, though Erdogan has played a decent hand with the cards that he has left, including the refugee deal he struck with uh, Merkel, which bolstered his regime at a critical time of vulnerability. And he has also benefited from an increasingly chaotic international environment where leaders like him are becoming the norm rather than the exception, even in the traditional core of the international system. We have finally reached a point where very little juice is left either in the Turkish economy or in <coughs> Turkish foreign policy. Turkey is a country that's running on fumes in all senses. But uh, how long it can keep going is anybody's guess, given the fact that Erdogan has successfully dismantled all the sources of domestic opposition in the meantime. I'm nearly out of time, so let me reiterate that my purpose in drawing attention to the international drivers of Turkey's political trajectory was not so that we would let Turkey off the hook. As in Tolstoy's maxim about unhappy families, there are a lot of problems that are specific to Turkey that makes it an unhappy country in its own unique, unique way. Uh, problems that my fellow panelists will draw attention to. But we also have to place Turkey in a broader global context of the crisis within the West and the hype of rising powers and the attendant distortions caused by that hype. In that sense, what has happened in Turkey is not unique at all. And it is yet another tragic consequence of the grave political mistakes and economic crises of the first decade of the 21st century in the global order. At a certain level of abstraction, one could even trace the tragedy of Turkish democracy to the same causal chain of events that drove Brexit here in Britain, for instance. If there is one uh, big conclusion to be drawn from all of this, it is that it no longer makes sense that if it ever did to think of the West and the rest as separate, independent entities with their own separate fates and futures. What happens in Washington, London, Paris, etc., has unforeseen consequences for Ankara, Rio, Delhi, and vice versa. Thank you.